welcome, welcome to this meeting that uh, Lonnie Burstein puts together uh, from time to time. When's the last? When's the last time, Lonnie? I think it was November uh, 19, I believe. All right. So it, was, was, it, was, it was the fall of 19. Okay, not that long ago. Yeah. And this is fantastic that we have, uh, he, he puts together his colleagues and we can all talk to them. And But first we're gonna go through them and let Lonnie introduce them uh, so we can hear what the various uh, jobs they're doing and the various careers they have. And uh, then we can open it up and find out stuff. I mean, definitely, I don't even know how you look for a career anymore in the time of a pandemic and all that. It was certainly uh, frightening to me when I got out of college. So, uh, so this is a fantastic opportunity for you coming out of college to uh, meet the people who are further down the road, the road that you want to travel. So without further ado, uh, I'll just thank everybody for coming and turn it over to Lonnie Burstein. Great, thank you. Thank you, Professor Wasser. Um, as we said, we've done this a few times before and we just really wanted to be casual. Um, ask pretty much any questions you want of us. I think I have seven or eight colleagues here with me, all from different areas of, of the company and of the Wendy Williams show. Uh, I'll try to be brief on my background. I come out of, well, first of all, I come out of Brooklyn College. I'm a Brooklyn College graduate class in 1982. Um, so, uh, you know, my, I started my career pretty much in New York at a consulting firm, learning TV programming and TV research, and then I moved on to uh, uh, the Fox affiliate in Philadelphia as the program director for a few years there, where I started meeting some of the people on, on this call with me, uh, then was uh, recruited by Universal Television and moved to LA nearly 30 years ago, where I became head of research for Universal Studios, where I... Uh, did that for many years, moved into uh, development, creating and, and TV shows for syndication. And then in 2004, I moved over here to Debmar Mercury, which is this little stealth independent company that's kind of done great things in the past 15 years, including the Wendy Williams show where we have a bunch of Wendy Williams staffers here with me. Um, besides Wendy Williams, we also the syndicators of Family Feud, which is the number one game show and TV right now in syndication. We've done shows in the past, Celebrity Name Game and Court in Providence. We we did um, Tyler Perry sitcoms when they were in syndication about a decade ago, uh, House of Pain and uh, Meet the Browns. And a slew of others, a sitcom with Charlie Sheen called Anger Management. Um, we did just finished a two year run of a show called Court in Providence with this kind of cool judge out in Providence, uh, uh, Rhode Island, where we've also become a great viral show for us, viral video show. And now we're in the preparations for launching a, a huge talk show in September with uh, Nick Cannon, who I'm sure you all know, um, that will join Wendy as our two talk shows. And that'll also, as Wendy is, will also be produced in New York City. Um, so that's kind of Deb Martin, that's kind of me. Um, one by one, I'm just gonna introduce my colleagues, which are, are, are uh, some are from the Deb Martin Mercury Company and some are from the Wendy Williams Show. We'll start with Adam Lewis. Um, Adam is our Senior Vice President of Marketing. So he, he, it, it, in a nutshell, it's Adam's job and he'll go into much more detail of getting the word out there about our shows. Adam, wanna give him a brief? Sure. Uh, like Lonnie said, I, I sort of run the marketing department, which means all the commercials you see on air, uh, you know, on the next episode of the Wendy Williams show, you know, the family feud, exciting promos, uh, talking about the next week or month, whatever it is that goes through my department, my division. Um, we also, you know, Billy Marcus, you'll meet in a second. He's on our sales team. Uh, we create all the materials before you guys get to even know a show exists, we put it all together to try and get our sales team out into the field, talking to the clients to make sure they have everything they need to get that sale done. Um, as the president of our company likes to say, everything is sales. So we make sure that they're armed and, and, uh, and ready with anything they could need. Uh, I work closely with both Karens on this. Uh, you know, Lottie does a ton of research stuff. We make it look as pretty as, as we can. Uh, and then the other Karen who you'll meet, uh, uh, Karen Bonk, she does all of our integrations and 
um, advertising. I'll let her explain that, but we, we try and load her up with as many videos and things as we can. So basically anything creative you guys see comes out of our department, taxi sides, bus fronts, all the graphics that all comes from my department. Thanks, Adam. Uh, next, we have just mentioned Karen Bunk, who's our senior vice president of brand partnership. She's really an integral part of the company. She makes us a lot of money. So she's a you know, very, very important person. <laughs> Thank Karen? you, Lonnie. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I haven't closed any deals yet today. So, um, <laughs> but anyways, I, yes, I run all of the brand partnerships for the show and on social. So, you know, any of the sponsorship stuff you guys see for Wendy or other shows um, has either been sold or co-created by me with our producers like Suzanne Bass, for example, is so creative and, and helps me come up with great ideas and she has great ideas and helps um, produce a lot of this content in show. And then I also collaborate a lot with Tristan's team to do a lot on social. So anytime you see anything sponsored or um, promoted on social, that is also coming through my team and work closely with our advertising sales team as well. Great, thanks. Thanks. Uh, next is Bill Marcus. Um, Billy is um, actually a sales consultant to the company and has a, has been a salesperson selling syndicated TV shows for, I guess, over 30 years, huh, Bill? And has sold some of the biggest shows in our business, um, including the Wendy Williams show, Bill. I remember I first met Lonnie when I was 22 years old and he was a rep at Celtel and I was scared shitless to call on him because he was Lonnie Burstein and I was so scared. <laughs> So that's, we go way back, we go way back. Yeah. Um, I've, I worked at Fox and Warner Brothers for like 25 years. I was the sales manager at Warner Brothers, sold Friends, Ellen DeGeneres, um, TMZ, Two and a Half Men, a lot of shows that I was responsible for selling. As a consultant, I do a lot of things. So I help Deb Marcel, Wendy Williams, Nick Cannon. Um, they also have a digital network called Buzzer that they're partners with Fremantle. It's 50 year old game shows. It's like the family feuds with Richard Dawson and match game. And we sell those in broadcast and on OTT spectrums like Roku or um, Samsung. Um, on top of that, I, uh, I have my own little show. It's a once a week Broadway show that I sell. I help another company sell um, documentary network, fight network, game tune, all these different uh, networks that we sell to Roku and Samsung and all these different OTT outlets that you probably watch. And then I have um, one more thing that I just finally closed today. I've been working on it for eight months. I worked, I got a partner and we just bought Azteca Network and I got it signed today. So eight months, every single day working on it. Finally got it done. Billy's so, middle name is Hustle. So uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, thanks Bill. Uh, next we have Ray Noya, who's his line producer for Wendy Williams. One of our Wendy lifers has been there from the very, very beginning from when the show started in uh, 2009 when right that is true all uh 12 years of it it's been uh it's been doesn't provide. eight right the sneak peek was in 08 um hi everybody welcome right. um yes i'm the line producer at the wendy show um 30 years in the business uh started out in 1990 working in um news um did that for about 15 years um in entertainment news i worked at the show extra a current affair i worked for geraldo in the beginning and then I bounced around to CBS News, NBC, and ABC, um, freelanced at all the morning shows. Uh, be ready to get up early if you're going to do that, because when you have to be on location at 4 o'clock in the morning, you have to get up at 1.30. Um, this is not a 9 to 5 business. Um, and then in 2004, transitioned over to the talk world. I'd never really worked in studio television before, only in news gathering in the field. Um, in 2004, joined the Tony Danza show, which got me into a studio environment. Um, that show got canceled after two years, went on to Rachel Ray, started that for a year, then to Tyra in 2007 for a year, which led me to Wendy. Um, so sometimes getting let go of a job is a good thing um, because it got me here and um, I'm part of this family for 12 years. I love it. I love the people I work with. Every day going to work is a pleasure. Um, I do behind the scenes work as far as crewing the show. I deal with real hands-on production issues, cameras, lighting, audio. Again, I crew the show. Uh, Matt is my boss in conjunction with him. We oversee all of the production on the show and make sure that it runs smoothly on a day-to-day -day basis. That's kind of a nutshell. We should have had everyone do this. Ray, where'd you graduate from college? Oh, New York Institute of Technology, 1990 in Old Westbury, Long Island. Great. Thank you. Well, when we get back to everyone, we'll, we'll do that. 
Next up is uh, the world famous Suzanne Bass, the co-executive producer of the Wendy Williams Show. If you are fans of Wendy, you certainly probably have seen the show. You probably know Suzanne. Suzanne? Thank you, Lonnie. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Suzanne Bass. I've been working in the business for 25 years. I just turned 50. Um, I've mainly wor worked on talk shows. Um, a couple that, that you probably may know, the Rosie O'Donnell show. I worked for Martha Stewart. Um, I did a little bit of reality TV in between. I actually worked at Extra with Ray years ago. Um, but I've been at Wendy since 2009. I was not there for the initial sneak peek, but I came in season one. I've been there for 12 years. Um, as a co-executive producer, I work with all the producers on the show. So the show, talk shows are segmented. So every segment gets a producer. I work with those producers, um, you know, conceiving ideas, booking talent, um, overseeing the scripts, the graphics, the music, um, all of those elements that go into each segment. I oversee with the producers. Um, so I work, you know, day to day, every show. I help um, set, line up the shows. Um, we have, I meet with the talent bookers. We discuss, you know, celebs that we want to go after. Um, I oversee the booking of stylists that come on our show. We have a lot of beauty experts um, and we have chefs. I oversee some of those bookings. And like Karen Bonk said, I work with her on integrations, um, conceiving ideas for those. And the other big thing I do is I work with the audience. And if you guys know our show, you know that our audience is amazing. Uh, I'm not taking full credit for that, of course, but I'm saying I work on that. Um, our audience is a really important part of our show. They are Wendy's co-hosts. And we use them throughout the show um, to keep the show going. They, they, you know, ooh and ah and clap and all this stuff that they do. I work with the audience to get those reactions. I also chat with Wendy throughout the show, throughout Hot Topics. Um, so it's a lot of fun. It's definitely, you know, different because not all TV producers end up um, you know, being on air like I have, but it's something I fell into and it's been a blast. We now have to get Suzanne her own security details. She's mob. <laughs> exactly. I do. I do get recognized at, <laughs> in airports, in various stores I go shopping in, um, which is kind of cool. You know, I didn't really set out for that to happen, but it happened and it's, it's been fun. Great. Thanks, Suzanne. You're welcome. Uh, Next up, the one and only Tristan Zimmerman, who's our Vice President of Digital Marketing, oversees everything in social media. Tristan? Yep. Hi, uh, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I uh, graduated Boston University in 2004, um, and my plan was to go into news, uh, political news. I uh, interned at Meet the Press in, uh, in my, between my junior and senior year, and I was hoping to uh, go into news and cover the 2004 presidential election. Uh, I ended up getting a job at the Tony Danza show, which is where I met Ray Noya, who would uh, give me a ride up the West Side Highway to my apartment on uh, 96th Street. Uh, I was a receptionist there and then um, moved over to be uh, the executive producer's assistant, who is now uh, David Perler, who's the executive producer of uh, Wendy. Um, and then after Danza got canceled, moved over to Warner Brothers, worked um, on the, uh, the show Keith uh, Ablo, which was like a Dr. Phil type show. Uh, that show lasted for a season. Um, and then I moved over to um, working in development uh, and um, worked on a bunch of their websites, freelance writer for TMZ. We launched a website called Mom Logic, uh, which was geared towards moms. Um, and then I also worked um, booking the presidential candidates uh, on Tyra Banks. So that was uh, uh, when uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, John Edwards were uh, running for president. Uh, I guess that was what, 2008, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also did a bunch of pilots for, um, for Warner Brothers. So with one with Janine Pirro, which became a court show. Um, 
Carlos Watch, Watson, MC Search. Um, so worked behind the scenes, you know, as a sort of like an AP um, producing uh, with those. And then after, then I went and I finally got into um, overseeing digital for the Tyra Bank show. So I uh, oversaw her website and social media. And this is really when social media was starting to become, you know, part of, T, you know, TV is sort of an integral part um, of launching a, uh, launching a show. And then Wendy launched in 2009. So I moved over to Wendy and been with the show um, running their digital and social um, since season one. And then three years ago, um, I joined Debmar Mercury um, to oversee all of their digital uh, and social media marketing for all, for all of our shows. So Wendy, Cotton Providence, uh, Central Ave, um, and then we're, now we're launching uh, Nick Cannon. Great, thanks, G. Um, next up, um, next to last, Matt Ozzel, who's our vice president and executive in charge of the Wendy Williams show and uh, oversees everything below the line on the show. Matt? Right. Uh, so, yeah, I like to say I have the decidedly unsexy part of television. I do everything that uh, is uh, behind the scenes um, from making sure there's pencils and pens to negotiating labor contracts, paying the crew, hiring the crew, dealing with studio deals, it, literally everything uh, operationally that is non-creative. So in daytime TV, the best way I describe it to uh, those you know who are not in the business is there's a CEO, if you will, a creative head, uh, which is David Perler in our case, and an operations head, which is me, um, you know, in our case of the show. Um, I graduated in 94. Three in December of 93, because I didn't really want to be in college, but I also didn't want to be home. So I, uh, so I went to, I, I did summer classes and I graduated quickly. Uh, so I graduated in December, early in December of 93. Um, then I moved to New York and took an internship with the Maury Povich show, started uh, there as an intern, then became a receptionist. Uh, and then he announced he was going to do a show with his wife, Connie Chung. He got mad at Paramount and was going to go do a show with Connie Chung. And he made that announcement. And I thought, well, this isn't going to work. I need to find another job. Maury, Maury's going to, you know, not have a, a gig anymore, and I'm not going to have work. So I need to go find another job. So I promptly uh, went and found a job at NBA Entertainment, where I worked there with, uh, you know, Willow Bay and Ahmad Rashad on a little show called Inside Stuff. And uh, had, you know, lo and behold, I was was there during the uh, Michael Jordan heyday. Um, uh, we launched the NBA channel and the WNBA while I was there. And I did, did everything involved with all of their uh, anything. They had a studio facility in Secaucus, which has now been knocked down into a Buffalo Wild Wings. But uh, at the time, we were doing all kinds of shows for uh, ESPN, uh, ESPN2, ESPN3, ESPN4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And, you know, everything. My goodness. Uh, we were just producing. We were essentially a marketing arm for NBA and, uh, and would produce shows and then give them or sell them to any outlet that would buy. After that, I, I left NBA Entertainment um, and went to, where did I go? PBS, WNET in New York, and made shows uh, huge. I did everything from the pledge drives to, uh, to huge outdoor performances shows with uh, Josh Groban at the Greek and and Eric Clapton with his Crossroads Guitar Festival and Andrea Bocelli in, in, uh, in Vegas. Then I qu quit that because I got, uh, I got you know, uh, I, I got a call from the exec in charge at Montel saying, please, because Tristan went to go work with Keith Ablo and uh, that a lot of people from Montel went to go work with Keith Ablo and, and uh, I, I worked at Montel for two years and then that led to Wendy um, and I've been at Wendy since the inception, which is 13 years. Um, there's a very few of us lifers, and and that's uh, that's where I am to this day. Thanks, Matt. And then finally, our last introduction, uh, Karen Beck, who who um, has multiple roles. She's a director of distribution for a show called In Depth with Graham Bensinger, but is also a consultant to Debmar Mercury in research and sales. Is my right hand, who I couldn't live without i'd have to do a lot more work than i'd really want to do so thank you karen wherever you where are there you are okay, okay. 
Hi, everyone. Thanks, Lonnie. Um, first of all, I should have gone by my maiden name for this because how confusing is Karen Bonk and Karen Beck, but here we are. Um, I graduated from York College in Pennsylvania, which is a small private school um, in 2004. My first job was also with the Tony Danza show, but I guess I didn't make a big enough impression on Tristan for him to mention me when he said that he met <laughs> Ray there. Um, <laughs> you give me a ride home. That's true. <laughs> Um, but I worked as an assistant in their audience department, which was so much fun. I was 22 years old and right out of school and just kind of meeting all different people every day. But one of my professors at college had told me that sales was really where, quote unquote, the money was. So when a position opened up um, that my cousin had heard of at Fox in the sales department, I interviewed and got and moved over to that position um, as an assistant. And I have to say the one thing that I did there that I did right was I was just an assistant and you could make it as an assistant you could really just bring people coffee and do expense reports and book travel and call it a day but I decided to make more of the position and sort of learn as much as I could with the various different departments and through that um, I met a guy by the name of Frank who heads up programming for the Fox TV station group and he was relocating from um, LA to New York and needed somebody to do programming with him. And so when he made that move, I was uh, offered the position. I worked with him for about 12 or 13 years where I just sort of made my way up the ranks at Fox. Um, what we did there in programming was we purchased the rights to shows and figured out like where they were gonna run in the different cities across the country. And we started working with Debmar. And one of the shows that came out of that was a little show called Wendy Williams, which at the time was groundbreaking because it was sort of the first show where it was a talk show, but they wanted to do a test run where it was going to be on in a bunch of cities across the country for an eight week period, six or eight weeks, six, uh, six. 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 And um, so for us, it was a win win because we were able to sort of see how the show performed without putting all of our money in and committing to a multi year um, commitment. So it was a really unique situation. And obviously, Wendy came into New York and just was gang busters right off the start. So we were really, really happy with that. And so um, that's kind of how I got involved with working with Debmar. And um, when I left Fox in 2016, um, after having three little kids and really going crazy with my commute, <laughs> um, I decided to go out on my own a little bit and make a schedule that allowed me to get my feet wet in a bunch of different areas of the business. Um, one of which, as Lonnie mentioned, is doing research for Debmar. So basically, um, as Adam mentioned in the beginning, um, anytime that a show is going into the marketplace, um, there's a bunch of sales materials that need to get put out to the potential clients. And that would be the stations that may be airing the show or to advertisers or you know anybody that could be potentially working with the show. There's a bunch of research that needs to go into it. So I do all of the um, research presentations that go to stations. And then also, as he mentioned, I handle sales for a show called In Depth with Graham Bensinger, which is a sports interview show. Um, I handle all the sales for all the stations across the country, as well as streaming and international sales. And I also do their integration. So um, kind of what Karen does for Wendy, I do for his show. Um, if we have an advertiser who wants to be like in one of the episodes, I'll handle figuring out how to get them in the episode. So like GMC is a sponsor of the show. And so we'll have Graham driving around in a GMC and that's like a custom integration for GMC. Um, and I also teach a course called Media Management at Malloy College that I kind of created um, because when I was in school, all of my courses were production. And I felt that I had one course that was called Media Management that sort of taught me the business of TV. And that was the only one. I felt like a lot of colleges that I knew didn't really have something like that. So I kind of created it with my old professor and I still teach that um, here at Malloy. And that's- Thank you. So I see how a little bit about everyone, a lot about some people, uh, about what we do, um, our backgrounds. Please feel free to ask any questions about what we do, how we started our careers, where we interned. I'm sure we've all interned, I guess. Um, uh, questions about producing TV in the pandemic, anything you'd like. So it's an open um, forum. Go ahead. 
I'm sorry. Yes, um, I, I just have like two questions for all of you guys. Yeah. Um, so like how do you guys juggle like everything that you guys do? Juggle at the same time. You mean juggle on different roles? Yes. You get you get you you get used to it, you know. It, yeah. It's hard. It's, it's extremely hard to get used to that routine. But eventually, it stops being scary, and you start to figure out what piece goes where, and then it's not scary anymore. It, it it's it's not something you can take a class to figure out. It's not something um, that you just know how to do. You you just go in and you get dirty. You get your hands dirty. That's how that's how it works. I mean, you can tell you can tell pretty early on with someone young that you hire, if they're going to be the person you think they can get to, or if they're not, it's, if you're not scared, if you, you know, I, I, my first job out of college was, I thought I wanted to be an agent or a manager. And, you know, they, they don't give you five minutes to figure out what's what they say, Hey, you're going to roll calls with us. And I didn't know what that meant. And you just say, absolutely. Like I'd figure it out because if you don't yeah. figure it out, maybe it's not for you and you move on to something else. And I kind of didn't care if they yelled at me and that yeah. that's the best way I can explain. How do you juggle it? You just, you put your head down and you get into it and you're either going to figure it out and you're going to like it and you're going to move on in that area, or you're going to realize pretty quick that I hate every ounce of this and, and you're not. That's great. You know, what I add to it is um, if you know the word triage, which I learned from watching the show MASH many years ago, which was, you know, you take the most important cases first. It's really each day I look at it and it's a triage of that day. I'm like, what do I have to get done today, right? That is vital to today, you know, and what can I put off till tomorrow? Um, and Debar is a great experience. We're a much smaller company than all our competitors. Um, we, so most of us wear many hats. Um, so you, you have to uh, prioritize, you know. You have to, I okay. agree with that. I was going to say you have to constantly reevaluate that too. You know, my biggest priority that I wanted to get done on Friday yesterday changed this morning when I got a new client request. So you have to be flexible and, and able to pivot when needed. And like Adam said, just sort of dive in. You're going to make mistakes. I started my career at NBC Universal. I got that job by just applying anywhere to any single opening that they had in their media division. I applied online. I didn't know anybody. I was just relentless. And when I started that job, um, you know, in ad sales, I didn't know that I even wanted to do that. I just wanted to work in TV and, and that was the job I did. Um, and I pivoted my career from there, you know, so I think you just have to um, yeah, dive in head first and, and mm -hmm. be a bit fearless. You're going to make mistakes. That's okay. I do, I do it in an old fashioned way. I get like a little pad of paper and I just write down everything I have to do. And I cross it out. And when I add things, I just add it on and I do it every day. And then at the end of the day, I carry it to the next day. I was just going to add that same exact thing, Billy. One of my, when I be, went to Philadelphia as a program director, the general manager said that he was, you have a to-do list. And I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> like yeah. I, he, he said, you need a to-do list. And every day of my career since then, I've had a to-do list, you know, next to me on my desk. Our yeah. boss, the, the co-president of our company carries around a blue pen and these little post-it notes at, no matter what time of day, what day it is, we, you know, we could be at a cabana in Las Vegas next to the pool and he's got his little pad of paper and his blue pen to write down something when it comes up always. And, and part of our work is being at a cabana sometimes at a, a pool in Las Vegas. Well, I, you know, I see everyone's putting in the chat, so it's great. Let's just go down to the first uh, question, what qualifications do you look for in interns? And I'm going to throw that over to Matt and Ray because their area kind of oversees it for the Wendy Williams show. You know, so go ahead. Matt? Um, you know, Ray and I don't actually interview the interns. Patrick does, who's not on this call. But for us, you know, a good intern is someone – I started out as an intern. I think for me personally, obviously, that's the – the, the premier way to break into the industry. I wanted to be in radio. I, the, when I graduated, that's all I wanted to do was be in radio. Well, I got an internship at the Maury Povich show and have never had a job in radio in my entire life. So, uh, but, but an internship, 
uh, to, to what Adam was saying, uh, will truly open your eyes to all of the possibilities in television. And for me, I decided very early on that I did not want to be in a subjective, creative place because I saw too many times, you know, uh, creative people create something and then have it destroyed by their superior. You, why'd you pick that music? Why'd you pick that shot? And I thought, well, you know, I don't really, for me personally, I don't want to uh, be in a, in a role where I'm creating something and then having it torn down. So I'm gonna go on the operation side. And, and that worked out well for me. In terms of what, so I think an internship is a very good way to get in. So what do I look for in an intern? This sounds absolutely ridiculous, but the number one thing that an intern needs to, you know, to, to bring to the table is availability, be on time, be a, a hustler, be aggressive in trying to figure out where, um, where there is a need and how you can meet that need. You know, what, what needs to be done? People are talking about to-do lists and, and making a to-do list. Uh, the quality of, of sort of intuitiveness, being able to understand what needs to be done to help move the, the, the process forward and figuring out what you can do to help fill that gap. If you make my job easier, if you make Suzanne's job easier, if you make Lonnie's job easier, you're a rock star. So, to me, being on time and being available, I, when I moved to New York, I had, I had the assistance of my mother who was paying my rent, so God bless her, but that was it. And I worked five days a week at the Maury Povich show. At the time we were not getting paid, I was there every day from you know, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And I made money at night at temp agencies, you know. and I, I don't really know when I slept, but it was fine, I was 21. So. Um, you got to be available. You got to be hungry. You've got to be, um, you, you, you've, you've just got to be hungry is, is, is what I would say. I don't know if that resonates with anybody. Okay. Ray, Thank you, you want to add anything? Um, to well, I, I agree with Matt as far as what he's saying about um, availability and diligence. Um, you know, I did, uh, I did help start the internship program at the Wendy Show. And the biggest thing for me is that you show up on time, you are, you are present when you are there, and you want to learn, and you want to be, you're enthusiastic, and you want to do anything that is asked of you. I interned at MTV back when they used to pl actually play music videos. That's how old I am. Um, I also interned at Virgin Records, and like Matt, I also interned and then worked at a radio station because I also wanted to be in radio and came this close to becoming a DJ until the program director quit to go to a, to become an A&R guy at a big record company. He was going to put me on in the overnights, and the new guy that came in didn't know me, and that was that. So, um, And then I did end up getting my first PA job in television, and here we are 30 years later. Um, but A, intern for the experience. B, be present, do anything. Nothing gets under our nerves more than interns who show up and look like they don't care. Because why are you there? You're taking up the spot that another person who is interested in the job could be doing and could be learning. Look, you guys are going to be us someday. And that's how I got my start. So you have to be present. You have to be enthusiastic. And, you know, the only other analogy that I'll make is 30 years in the business, I'll still go get Lonnie coffee if he needs it. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, <laughs> if you ever come back to New York. Yeah, exactly. Um, thanks. Uh, I hope that helps on that question. Uh, um, I'm looking at what work experience has really helped from Yeshi has really helped you break in and would you change your direction if you had the choice? Early work experience. Uh, um, anyone want to handle that? Anyone like crew? It's an interesting question. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I can answer it a little bit. I, um, I think a general theme you're going to run into is all of us coming out of college probably had a dream of doing one thing and ended up doing something else. <laughs> so, you know, in a related yeah. field, I, all I ever wanted to do was be a, a sports producer when I was coming out of Brooklyn College. That, that was my dream. Um, and it's in a very difficult area to break into. And after spending two years of graduating, uh, after graduation of really not being able to find a job, did a few internships, even though you're not supposed to intern after uh, you graduate, I managed to pull that off um, and still not be able to get a job in sports um, through uh, 
a friend, I got an, in, uh, an interview at a company. I didn't even know what they did. It was called Celtel, where we they sold advertising time, but they needed people in the programming area to do research. And I interviewed for it and was pretty good at it. And then uh, um, that is the one that set me in my direction. And a year into that job, I was offered a, a job at Major League Baseball Productions um, producing which was my dream. And I had to make a, a life decision as 26 or 27. And I decided, you know what, I think I'm good at what I'm doing and I'm going to pursue it. Um, and, and, you know, that, that was the change in direction and seeing I was doing something that I was good at it, you know, so, and I stayed with it. I have a similar story, Lonnie. I wanted to move to New York and I really wanted to be a, a producer. That was my, my goal. And I was like, I, you know, inter I couldn't afford to just take an internship. I had internships when I was in college, but I, I had to pay New York City rent. So I couldn't afford to not get paid. And I got two different job offers. One was a production, like a PA for, you know, $17,000 a year with no benefits. And one was for almost double that for an ad sales gig. So you can guess which one I had to take. Um, which was fine. And then I did get the opportunity to switch back to purely creative a few years, years down the line. But to Lonnie's point, you know, I had enjoyed the skills I had built up and realized that that was really more where I belonged. And I just tried to bring more creativity into the role by switching into doing branded content versus just ad sales. Great. Thanks. Right. I'll say something, Lonnie. Ahead, I'm a little bit different. At 12 years old, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to sell TV shows. And I had an older sibling who's 10 years older who was doing it. So my whole life, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I went to college, graduated college, went to Europe for a year. And when I came back, I started interviewing for everywhere. And I offered to work for free. And I made a deal with a company that I'd worked. I lived in Manhattan Beach in Los Angeles on the beach. And I offered to work at a television station in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And it was winter. And I'd never been in Milwaukee. <laughs> really cold. And I said... I'll work there for six months. If I do a great job, then you, they owned a syndication company as well. I go, then you promote me there. And I'll go, I'll work for six months for free, but then I get promoted. And they hired me on the spot into the syndication just by the fact that I said I'd do that. And I was willing to do it. So I would, I just, I had a dream. I knew what I wanted to do. And I was going to, no matter what, I was going to do it. Cool. Anyone else want to add or we, I can move on to the next? Um, I mean, I would just say, you know, going after internships in areas or you know that you think you would want to you know work in as when I interview people now for positions um, even if they don't necessarily have the specific experience with maybe social or or digital but to see that they you know have interned at an you know in the entertainment industry at another at another show or you know even you know somebody I hired uh, you know who's on my team now at Wendy um, you know, work in radio WBLS, um, but, you know, had similar, had social media experience, didn't have TV experience, but, um, you know, was, was doing a similar job, you know, in, in radio. So I, I think trying to get yourself into those, you know, internships that you can put on your resume um, so that when you're applying for a job, you know, you, you, you obviously have experience in the industry. Um, and I think that sort of helps you get, um, you know, a callback, especially if you don't know anybody. A lot of us here, we didn't know anybody, uh, you know, when we first applied for a job. I, you know, graduating college, didn't know anybody in entertainment. I literally sent like an email to like question at some random uh, uh, article I saw on like TV news check for the Tony Danza show. And it was really meant for advertisers to email about buying time buying commercial time in the Tony Danza show. Um, and it got got to, I didn't notice at the time, but got to <laughs> the head of ad sales for Buena Vista who forwarded it to the head of programming at, at Buena Vista who thought that I knew this guy. And next thing I knew, I was sitting in the production office of the Tony Danza show interviewing for the job. Didn't know anybody. And everybody was surprised that I didn't know who this guy was, you know? <laughs> so you gotta be creative in, in um, and also in, in trying to get your email you know, in, 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 the, in the door. Great, thanks. Hey, Bass, I'm gonna throw this question to you. Um, what are things you look for when you make a new segment to make sure it hits? 
Okay, great. Thank you, Lonnie. Um, I guess what you're looking for, obviously, we work in the field of entertainment and we want to entertain people. So specifically, I guess for the Wendy Williams show, um, you know, you're always looking for, if you're looking for a specific guest, you're always looking for somebody who's um, going to be great on TV who's, you know, outgoing, big personality. I've always told, um, you know, my background, like when I worked at the Rosie O'Donnell show, I worked with human interest guests. I was a human interest booker. So I booked real people. And I've always told real people that TV makes everybody smaller. So you have to be bigger than life and you will come off normal on TV. So you really look for people who have that in them to really bring it. Um, because people who bring it will be entertaining. Um, and at Wendy, we look for, you know, she loves, you know, we, we cater the, the segments towards what Wendy is, likes and what she's good at. So, um, you know, Wendy loves fashion. She loves beauty. Obviously she loves hot topics, um, but she does the hot topics, you know, on her own. But as far as beauty segments, um, and fashion segments, you look for stuff that's really going to excite Wendy um, so that she can showcase these products. You want an expert who's going to be well-spoken, like I said, big personality. And you want to you want to make sure your segment is filled with stuff that's interesting for your viewers, stuff that your your viewers are going to learn about. Um, your viewers are going to be impacted and entertained and want to watch and want to find out, you know, what the product is or how the segment's going to go or how the segment's going to end. So you want to make sure it's entertainment entertaining and that you're really um, giving your viewers something fun to watch. Okay, cool. Um, I, I would say right now I'm very involved in, in doing the uh, development for the Nick Cannon show, which debuts in September and figuring out exactly what we can and can't do with Nick to make it entertaining. So it's not so much as a segment, but, but the whole direction of the show and it's figuring out what your talent can do best and highlight, you know, and you want to build things that, that, uh, um, pushes them your talent to the top you don't want to give them something that they're not good at if you people have watched wendy there's obviously things we would never do on wendy that other talk shows do because she's a very specific talent um, where nick is going to be more i think is more of a generalist you know he, he's a, he has a broader scope of things that he can do than wendy like we would never do hot topics with nick in terms of wendy because he's gossip's not his thing you know where it is wendy's thing so it's it, it's really comes down and Suzanne touched on this of who your talent is and what is, is organic to them. So, um, okay, let's go. Uh, I, I might miss some because the, they're scrolling down and I'm sorry if I do. Um, when the pandemic first hit, what was the very first issue did you all have to tackle in your field of work? <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, um. I, 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 I'll just jump in real quick and I'll say, you know, we, 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 we shut down production for a period of time. And I have joked and said that the Wendy Williams show is actually running a COVID testing facility that produces a television show on the side. And there was a period of time where, you know, that was, there was no doubt that was absolutely the case. We were a, a COVID clinic and we had this little thing going on the side, which was the show that we did um, last year about this time, you know, we had shut down production. We weren't sure what we were doing. Um, fast forward, I don't know, to July, June-ish, July-ish and Lonnie and myself and some other, you know, uh, people were on the phone constantly trying to figure out what we were gonna do in terms of testing and how we were gonna open up the studio again, you know, fast forward to August. I mean, it was constant, it was constant phone calls and constant what if and how, and it just, you know, to the point where it was a little bit maddening, I'm not gonna lie, because nobody knew anything. And it was, it was frustrating and maddening to try to figure out how to, you know, because every, to do anything, because anytime that somebody would, you know, decide, well, this is how we're gonna do it, then, 
there would be a, a, a new problem. Well, we can't have audience, you know. So the long story short is, you know, we've landed at a place where we test everybody. We go, we do a COVID test every, every, every week for people working in the studio, uh, three times a week for Wendy and three times a week for, you know, senior staffers who are, uh, you know, close to the talent. Um, also various unions require uh, more testing and we adhere to that. Um, but COVID really, in, in as much as you're all sitting in your various places, which are not Brooklyn College, you know, uh, doing remote learning, it's affected us in the same way. We've had to adapt. We, we test like hell. I mean, I think we've spent, we've spent a lot of money testing. Um, so I don't know if that's a specific answer, but that's a general enough answer that it's, I, I guess, um, it, it's, it's really affected everything that we do. You know, we have Zoom guests. We, we're starting to get more and more guests in the studio, but, uh, you know, virtually everybody, we went from everybody appearing physically on our studio, on our studio set to being via Zoom and everybody that's in our, our crew, we have, our, we have basically our full crew and they're all tested on a weekly basis, um, which adds time and money to the, to the process. So I don't know, Lonnie, is that? Uh, it, it, you know, it was probably the most, not probably, it was the most challenging thing we've, I've ever had to face in my career. And I'm sure it was the same for all my colleagues too, because it, it, we're, we're in uncharted territory and there was no blueprint. You know, saying, and it was yeah, no one you could call, frustrating was no one you could no call and say, what would you do here? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, that's the so, frustrating part. There was no, there was no, there was no guy. There was no blueprint. Yeah, as you said. You know, so the first thing, you know, I, I hate, it sounds trite, but it was safety, you know, I was like, all right, you know, we can't do this, you know, and I, I distinctly remember on March 9th, having arguments with people at the show in New York about we can't have audience anymore. And I'm like, oh, no, we got to have audience. I'm like, we can't have audience. 72 hours later, we were shut down totally. And that's how quickly it happened. You know, so it went from no audience to we're not even going to do a show, you know, so we can't and you had to put safety first. And obviously, then, there, then rules and regulations came out by government that you couldn't. And then it was, as Matt said, it was four months of figuring out how to now, how are we going to do this? Because it isn't going to revert back to normal. Uh, um, and we've done it, you know. And and I, by our own admission, I don't think anyone thinks we were producing anywhere as near as good a show as we did, you know, uh, 15 months ago. But, you, you know, you make do. So, um, and that's what it is. Um, that was the pandemic. Uh, I mean, if I could just jump in real quick and just also speak to the the platform that we're on right now. Zoom became a part of our life. Yeah. You know, how, how many people really here knew what Zoom was last January? Um, I kind of did. And now I run the Zoom farm at the Wendy Show, which is six laptops that we put together in the course of literally one week and figured out how to integrate Zoom into the show, which has sustained us. It's how our guests appear. It's how our audience appears. Um, it's how some of our human interest guests appear. Um, and it's something that we all had to learn how to, you know, it's, I do run the Zoom farm and it's a job I didn't know I was going to have um, in July of last year. And then by the end of August, I'm the Zoom guy and we have a room and there's a system. I kind of came up with it on my own, but knowing this technology, obviously in the digital world where younger people are way more adept than I am, um, you know, learning stuff like this is also really important um, because, I, you know, Lonnie and or Suzanne and or Matt wanna, may want to correct me, but I don't see us ever doing the show again without Zoom being some part of it. I, I don't know, maybe two years we're not, but- Ray, you're fired for putting that, no, I'm kidding. I'm, no, no, he's probably correct. He's probably correct. Zoom is probably yeah. just gonna be a part of the show in some capacity, because it has opened up availability. We get people in LA that we normally might not be able to get because all you need is a laptop and someone has to wake up early. So just speaking to Zoom. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm just jumping around on the questions. This one, I think uh, uh, Billy and Karen Beck, um, do any of you venture into entrepreneurship or starting your own thing? And if so, what it's like balancing work and out of work personal endeavors? And we've had a couple of questions I've noticed about work-life balance, which is crucial so but uh karen you can go belly i'll go first 
I do it all the time. I like I said on in my opening statement, as Tech and Network is the Spanish network. It's like the fourth or fifth Spanish network in America. It's been around for 25 years. I call the COO every single day for eight months. He, he three months ago I thought I had it, it went away. Then I thought I had it, then it went away. I fall on my face 90% of the time I work, 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 and then it doesn't happen. But I just keep getting up and keep trying. But I do have some consultancies that are with like Debmart that are consistent. So when you keep trying, if you fall on your face, it doesn't hurt. When you, when you work at a company, and I worked at studios for like 20, 25 years, you get a paycheck every day. You get a paycheck. You know you're going to get a paycheck. I don't know if I'm going to get a paycheck. So I am scared every day. So I come to work and work really hard because it's the only way I know I'm going to make money. And I'm just, I'm driven and it just, it helps me. But it's, I love it. I would never want to go back work for a company. Never. If I could help it. Karen. And Karen and I talk all the time because she does the same thing. We always come up with different ideas. Trying. Yeah. So for me, like when I first left Fox where I had like a very structured day, um, now I kind of make my own hours with the various different jobs that I'm working with. But also I have three little kids who are young and need a lot of attention. And I do... Um, you know, Girl Scout leader and coach the different teams and were very involved with them. So at first I felt like I was just constantly a complete hot mess. Like I was literally just at the softball field on the phone, like just literally a complete disaster. And then when I, I always did make my list, but what I finally did that helped me was make a schedule for myself because I wasn't being told you have to be on this strict schedule. And I think without having that schedule, it was just a free for all for me. And I was up at 4 a.m. And, you know, so what I did was I carve out surf certain hours of the day where I dedicate to the different buckets in my life. And I think like ever since I've done that, I've really, really um, had more success. And the other thing that like we always do in my house as a family, like just going to the work life is like, not always possible with with various commitments but as often as we can we carve out like the hour for dinner where like no matter what we're doing I have that hour and I am like with my kids and so like I for me like just having more of a structure and holding myself accountable to it has always helped like keep that balance I'd like to add one thing and Karen might send me an email at one in the morning and I answer it and she goes I knew you were up working <laughs> that, that might happen once a week yeah <laughs> um, I, I would say a key to it, the work-life balance is who you work for, you know, so, yeah. uh, and what their expectations are and how they treat their work-life balance. And it's important for you to know that, you know, going into a job, there's some people who, who have no boundaries as bosses. Uh, um, and there's some people who just, you know, basically think as long as you get the job done, that's all I really care about, you know. This, the pandemic is actually exposing a lot of that and people realize, because we're all working from home now, you know, so it, it, there's a different work-life balance going on and they're show, showing up at the office for eight hours a day. And, um, and people are more accepting of just, well, if you do your job, do the job. Our EP of Wendy used to call me all the time and say, hey, you know, we've been uh, working really hard. Do you mind if I give everyone Friday off? And I'm like, you give everyone every day off. I, I, all I care is if the show goes on there on Monday morning. It just really doesn't matter. You know, it, um, unfortunately, not everyone has that attitude, you know, so, but it's important. And, and I work with people who prioritize their work over their personal life. I've, I'm, my personally, I never have, you know, it's just like, I just, it, it's really up to each person of what you want. And I work really hard, but I also know when I'm not working, I'm not working, you know, that's it, you know, uh, because, there's there's two type of people there's people who live to work and there's people who work to live so it, it's a personal choice and neither is right or wrong you know it's really what you want out of it so and, and you can be successful either way so um, I would just I would just add though that you know I think all of us would probably agree that in order to break into this industry like you're gonna have to put in long hours and you're going to have to work hard um it, like none of us just you know lonnie didn't just become the head of programming at Debmar <laughs> by walking in and saying hey i want to be the head of programming i mean he worked for years same you know with me like i started as a receptionist um out of college and you know now i'm 
vice president at Devmar. I, I started at Wendy, you know, being the web producer. And then after, I guess, probably nine, 10 years is, you know, when I got promoted, um, you know, for the corporate position. So, you know, it doesn't, it, you have to obviously find that balance and, and it's, you know, but I think in, in, you know, for success, like you, you do have to work hard and put in and put in the hours and just figuring out for yourself, um, you know, how to balance your personal life and your, you know, in your career. Mm. Okay. I'm going to try to think of uh, another question to take here, which is a good one to take. Um, one, does somebody has to be from working on talk and scripted. Is it, do anyone here, do have my career, anyone have any really scripted experience? Um, I don't think Yeah, so. when, I, when I was a at MGM. Yeah, I was at MGM and yeah. we did a, a bunch of scripted shows and it just, everything in scripted takes a lot longer. That's exactly <laughs> what I was about to say. When I was at NBC Universal and at ABC, um, I worked with scripted shows and particularly with brand content. It's like the lead times are so much longer. It's It seems like it's gonna be a sexy, fun thing to do, but um, it just ends up, the pace just ends up being really frustrating for me. I prefer working in either live to tape or more of a live environment when possible. They're, they're very different worlds. Wendy yeah. Williams, we, we do five shows a week. And in, at, when, you know, when, at Dabmar Mercury, we did anger management with Charlie Sheen and it was uh, sometimes two weeks for an episode, you know, just depending on if you showed up or not. Um, it's, a, it's a much slower pace. It's like a different world. So people, there's a reason I just didn't go into film at all. Like there's just no, like it takes so long. And, uh, you know, scripted, I, I, to their point, it just takes so long. A live environment, working in live television for me, I've, now I've been doing it for 13 years. I've said I'll never go back to doing a, even a tape television show because, I, you know, I have worked in tape television shows and to the point that everybody's making just with regard to time, you know, if you're trying to make an hour show, it's really 42 minutes, let's say, and then you'll shoot for 90 minutes and then you edit the hell out of it. And then that show doesn't see air for weeks at a time sometimes. So you're, you're, you're never quite through with it. On a live television show, we start at 10, we're done at 11 and we're on to the next thing. So um, having said that, if, if you wanna finesse something and you wanna you know, get everything just exactly perfect, maybe film or scripted TV is, is, is the way to go for, for, for me, I agree with what everybody else is saying. It's, it's, it, it, it seems like an ex, exercise in frustration. It, there's, there's so much to do on any given thing that sometimes we're blessed that we're out of the gate live at 10 and done at 11. I don't know. So, it, you know, it's a, it's a blessing in disguise in some ways. I think this is a question for all of us. It's actually a, a good question. Um, what motivated your passion for media what was your inspiration? Um, I think we've all maybe kind of most of us have touched on a little bit, but uh, um, maybe we could all try to briefly, but uh, for me, it was while being in college and not being fulfilled at my original choices and majors and uh, um, taking classes in television and radio and realizing, oh my God, this is like the core of my life. I go home, I watch TV. I'm like, <laughs> like, like duh, you know, um, and, and going home and being able to write papers on, on MASH certainly was better than science and things like that. So, um, and realizing, you know, I, I guess it was that one, you like something and two, you're good at it, you know, uh, 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 because I, and then really love it, you know, because I've maintained and people disagree with me you're not going to be real successful in something unless you love what you're doing so um you know and i've always loved what i'm doing so uh adam want to add? yeah i agree I, I grew up in los angeles and it was kind of all around the, you know that's that's sort of what it is out here um and so every class i took in college i went to uh, uc santa barbara you know there was a film program there that I didn't love. That was if you wanted to be Martin Scorsese, which I didn't, but I was able to take a bunch of writing classes that were all film based, a bunch of sociology classes and communications classes that were all entertainment based. And it really sort of, like Lonnie said, it's you look around and kind of everything I was ingesting uh, applied to what I was learning. And I liked it a lot. Um, 
And then knowing I was moving back to Los Angeles after college, and that was the industry that was out here. That's just where I sort of set my sights. Okay. Anyone like else to, want to tackle that? Yeah, I'd like to answer. You know, um, I'm a little bit different because I grew up way upstate New York. I didn't even have cable TV. I hardly watched any TV. I was not all about TV. So I went off to college and I did liberal arts for two years because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, but what I realized is that I was terrible at history and science and math. I mean, they just were not my, it was just not my thing. But what I realized is I love to be entertained and I love to entertain. So I was like, why am I not going into TV production? And that's what I did. So I did that my last two years of college and I aced all my classes all of my TV production classes, I created TV shows and I directed and I produced and all that. And I fell in love with it and luckily, you know, landed a job in it. And that's what I've done. And that's, I've never looked back. I have never, ever wanted to do anything else, but it hit me later in life. Okay. Where'd you go to college, Suzanne? Hofstra University on Long Island. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I've got one. I'll try and make this a really quick and uh, brief story about how I transitioned from being a marketing major. Um, it's 1987 and I'm at CW Post on Long Island and I'm in a marketing class and we were given a project by our professor to come up with a new product and uh, design a marketing campaign for it. Now, being older than you guys in 1987, CDs were becoming a real big thing because you you know record albums were still around and cassette tapes were still around and where i where i was growing up mixtapes were a huge thing i used to sit in front of my record player and make mixtapes all day long of all the different music i loved to put in my car so i didn't always have to listen to the radio so my group came up with this idea to do um cd players were in were coming around, but you couldn't, you know, burning CDs wasn't a thing yet in 1987. My group came up with the idea of a recordable CD player so that you could make mixed CDs because CDs were pretty indestructible. You know, audio cassettes, you throw them in your glove box. And if you live in the cold or the hot, they warp and they, they have a short shelf life. And my college professor didn't allow us to do the project because he said it was not a technologically feasible product that we had come up with the idea of. Um, and we were massively disappointed. And at the time I had a friend who was at the college that I ultimately graduated from was right next door to CW Post. And I used to go visit him. Uh, he was an architect major and they had a TV studio. And I started going there with all my free time and sniffing around the TV studios and started talking to professors. Um, and I did one year at CD, CW Post as a marketing major, transferred to New York Tech and was totally taken in by the television world and got my degree in two years. And there you go. Okay, thanks, Ray. Um, I think this is a key one probably everyone is interested in. Uh, do you have any tips on breaking the firewall that comes with online applications? Being that no company can see or speak to you, what are some ways to stand out in a resume or cover letter? Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to throw it out. I'll answer it too, but at a point, um, let's see who would be good for that. Matt, you want to take a shot at that or no? <laughs> I'm sorry. I was on mute. Uh, I, I was looking at that and, and, and to be quite honest, I was, the, there's a, the, something that says, do you have any resume format advice? And I was just, I, I, you know, I, the, if I'm being completely honest, I don't, I don't ever, ever uh, look through the, my first go-to when I'm hiring someone, which I recently did for a PA position is, is I start with my intern pool. I start with people who have done their time on the show in some way, shape, form or fashion. Uh, who's been here, who's seen how we do this, who has, who has given me their time, you know, for a semester as an intern or whatever. And, you know, we look at them first, then we broaden it out to, you know, who do you know? Um, 
Suzanne, who do you know? Karen, who do you know that could fit this role? And, um, you know, I, I, so I don't know that I have, I don't know that I literally have, you know, should your name be in four point Helvetica? I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. What I, what I would say is that an internship, you know, getting your foot in the door in some way, shape, form, or fashion, be it an internship or, you know, any other way, uh, to me is one of the sh most surefire ways, you know, so now that, that, that begs the question, well, how do I get the internship? Um, you know, I, I know on our side, I know for me, I just, as Tristan, you know, pointed out, he emailed some random, you know, email address for or buying ad time on the Tony Danza show. I was just, you know, voracious in same thing. I was, I was, I was reaching out to the Maury Povich. I was reaching out to any show to get an internship, to get in. I, you know, Billy said he worked someplace for free. It's, it's, it's that kind of stuff. It's that sort of hustle, you know, that I think a lot of us can, can, can demonstrate, you know, gets you in the door. So I don't, I, I don't know that it's as simple as, you know, 14 point Helvetica on your resume. I, I you know, I, I, I don't know how else better to answer that question, but I, I recognize that might not be satisfactory. <laughs> so I, I don't know what else to say. People like people like us in our, in our jobs don't, we have HR departments that help us out a, a great deal with that. There's going to be some times where you know someone over there and they're going to get you in. And then your resume, like Matt was saying, is a little bit less important what font and all that you use and it's more about you have this relationship and they want to talk to you about an opportunity um but i mean there's tons of recruiters and there's hr you know um summits and things like that that you that you can look up and 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 get into but and know, I, for, yeah i don't i, I would also it. recommend um on linkedin like if you find an hr rep for a specific company reach out to them proactively and see if you can submit your resume in general um i think you know HR folks are always looking for new ways to recruit. And if you're aggressive in that way and, and polished, just make sure you have a resume ready so you can follow up quickly. As long yeah, as it's work, clean and that, easy to read. No, I think that's true too, Matt. I think it's everything. It's like, yeah. but um, yeah, I think, you know, or if you find a specific job that you want and you can finagle figuring out who the hiring manager is or who the boss would be on LinkedIn, try to reach out to them directly. There's a lot of little tricks that you can find to figure yeah. out email addresses. I do it all the time when I'm trying to figure out a client, you know, that I've never yeah. spoken to before. It's yeah, a skill I, I still use. Minute, there's, there's, only, yeah. there's only 10 formats or five formats that email yes. follow. Yes. Yeah. Lonnie, asked, Lonnie asked us to get a biography for you guys for this session and I had a panic attack. It was like, oh my God, I don't, <laughs> I, guess, I guess I gotta do that. No, so yeah. but like the key is like if you're on LinkedIn and just to piggyback off of what you said, Karen, I tell my students this all the time, like they're going to ask you in a job description to submit something online. You should always submit it online also because you will have to be part of the pool. But then in addition to that, you can literally stalk your way through LinkedIn to see, totally. you know, friend of a friend who might have a connection. And even if you don't have a direct connection with somebody who works at that company just finding someone any way shape or form that can like actually forward it along and not right. go through the other chain yeah. and then if you can't do that at the very least address the um write something in your letter that addresses the person who is the head of the department that you're going after so like if you see that it's a certain department you can google who the head of that department is and at least put something a little bit more personal in the body of the email or some way that makes it stand out. Yeah, I, I, I would say, and, and Karen Bonk touched on it a little bit, first of all, be aggressive, right? Um, okay. Two, figure out who you need to talk to. I'm not a huge, you know, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm not a huge fan of sending an application to an HR department because they don't care. They, you know, they're just, they're, they have no connection to you. We just finished a show um, we did in Atlanta uh, called Central Avenue. And, and before we started production, like two years ago, some young woman sent me a resume, said, can I speak with you? I hear you're doing a show in Atlanta. I have no idea how she figured out how to speak to me. And my first thought is, if you could figure out that you need to get to me, which she didn't, by the way, there's other people who hire, but 
they work for me. <laughs> so uh, I'm like, well, if you're smart enough to get that, I'm going to tell my people that you need to talk to this girl. And I sent them their resumes and they're like, who is this? I'm like, I have no idea who it is, you know, but you know, she figured out to send me a resume. You could at least talk to her and interview her. And they hired her as a PA and they loved her. And she worked on the show for, you know, we did a test run last year and then we just did six months and she worked on the show and loved her. Um, and and all, all it showed to me was, you know, ingenuity, you know, she, she figured out, Call Lonnie Burstein, you know, <laughs> I don't, and I still to this day don't know how. I never really bothered asking her how she figured out you need to speak to me, but she did, or, or not that she needs to speak to me, but I was one of the people. And it was funny because the EP of the show, when I sent him the, her resume and said, you need, I want you to speak to this girl, right? He said, who is she? I said, I don't know. She sent me a resume. He goes, I tried to get in to see you to, to uh, pitch the Wendy Williams gig 10 years ago and you didn't answer my notes. I said, all you did was leave a resume at the front desk. You didn't figure out to contact me. You just left a resume. And that's the difference, you know? So, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's make connections, use. By the way, you're all going to be Brooklyn College graduates. Use that. Look where there's other Brooklyn College graduates working. You know, you, that, that to me, every time I see someone... I get a resume and it's not a lot, you know, cause I, I'm a, I don't get many resumes anymore, but if there's Brooklyn college on it, I immediately give it two more points. You know, I'm like, yeah, they share something with me, you know, use everything you have. I'm like, why wouldn't you, you know? So, um, but be aggressive and think, and, and Max true, but the, the internship cracking the first wall of the internship is extremely difficult. And I don't have a lot of advice on that one, but definitely intern, you know, that's, you know, we, every entry level position we've hired at Wendy for 13 years, I believe, has been someone who was an intern, you know, at the show. You know, we've hired a tremendous number of interns and I was an intern 27 years ago. So it's just, it's so instrumental in actually mm -hmm opening your your eyes to to what you know as Lonnie said or somebody said earlier we all think we know exactly what we want to do and uh and then you pivot because you either decide that you want to do something else when you, once you've seen it or you do what you think you want to do and you're like yeah this isn't as fun as I thought it was right. so um an internship is just it's like it's like coming to the buffet and you get to pick out whatever you want you get to be the the best damn producer you can be or the best operations person you can be or you know um so you're also you're also all in new york you know it, it's that's the hub of the media world you know los angeles and new york make sure that you guys are looking for opportunities in new york there's something called the national association of broadcasters and nab has a new york uh, office uh, with a big conference in Vegas and they're hiring interns and they're hiring helpers at the Javits Center you know when they're doing those things that uh, we were at uh, a similar conference in Miami god was it two years ago now or a year and a half ago now like pre-pandemic and all the all the kids that were volunteers there all came up and wanted my business card and sent emails and just said it was great to meet you I'm going to be graduating that you know can I talk to you then those are opportunities that I strongly suggest you guys hunt for in, if you're interested in the media landscape. It's as simple as Googling, you know, TV events in New York and just figure out how you can be a part of those. So it's a good first step. Yeah. Um, today alone, you're making connections, right? So that's a start. I just sent in any of my colleagues are welcome to do it. I just throw in the chat my email. You're welcome to write me, send me a resume, stay in touch. It's, it's, whatever by the way not everyone is going to be as welcoming I, don't, I, I don't actually, mess up the karens don't don't mix up those karens you'll <laughs> yeah. be on the blacklist i don't mind people reaching out to me you know? yeah I, I would actually say i've actually used linkedin a lot to hire uh people who work for me um and they usually end up being random people that are, i don't see as like direct connections but somehow you know they see my post and um uh you know i i end up bringing them in for an interview. Obviously their experience and internships are what I look for like the most. Um, you know, my web producer now at Wendy, again, she worked at Ricky Lake, her second show out in LA, didn't know her. Again, she found the right person to email uh, Lonnie's counterpart at Detmar Alexander, who's uh, uh, programming and based here in New York. Alexandra didn't know her. I didn't know her. Alexandra sent me the email because I just happened to be 
uh, interviewing for that position, and she's the person who uh, you know got the got the role. Uh, a Brooklyn College graduate, uh, Kenya Reyes. Um, she, I, I was hiring an intern for the first time. You know, she, she found my post on LinkedIn. Uh, came in for an interview. Um, it was between her and another Brooklyn College uh, student. And I hired her because she sent me a thank you email. You know, you always send thank yous. Yeah, I never I never heard from the other uh, student again. Uh, and then I ultimately ended up hiring Kenya as um, uh, a, a PA for the web department. Um, and, and now she's uh, over at HBO. Um, so you know, definitely, you know, definitely thank you emails, you know, help. And I actually, I will say before I actually do it, uh, I will say if anybody's graduating, I am actually going to be interviewing for a social media production assistant position for the Nick Cannon show, uh, which will start sometime in August. So if you, there you go. Like, how awesome is that? <laughs> you can email me your resume. <laughs> you know, the, uh, <laughs> it's called now having, you know, if you're available for a job and, you know, after the summer, you know, you now know something that most of the world doesn't. So, you know, there's a job available and you, you now have an entree into it. There so, you thanks, you. Tristan. Uh, uh, um, yeah. You know, it, I, I didn't add something to that, you know, and also when you're in your jobs, it, it, it's to be smart about your career moves. It, when I started my job, it was a really low paying, I'm starting my career, a low paying job that a, diff, a million different people had, you know, and a lot of people I worked with would go from one company to the other and for like $3,000 raise. I, I was at a crappy company. We were the lowest of everyone who did what my company did. We were the worst, no doubt about it, but it gave me great exposure to start my <laughs> career. No, there's no doubt. We, we were horrible. You know, Billy knows that, you know, we, we were the, the worst company in the business and people would leave to go to better companies for like two or $3,000 raises. And they're like, Lonnie, why don't you try to like leave? You're really good. You could get another job someplace. I'm like, yeah, and then I'm going to be on the bottom of the totem pole again, and now well, I'd have a three thousand more dollars. I'm making a name for myself in this company. You know, at the end of the day, three thousand dollars didn't make that much of a difference. You know, so uh, um, whereas expanding my reach within the company I, I was at did. You know, so it's being strategic as as well. You know, uh, of being what you're doing. You know, we all want to make more money, no doubt. You know. Um, but also be smart about the career decisions you make. What doors mm -hmm. is that job going to open for you? You know, and, so who are you going to be exposed to in that job? And Lon, to that point, I, I know everyone's been talking about internships and I, they are important if you can, I did mine when I was in school so that, because I couldn't afford to do it once I graduated because I lived my time, my parents live in Virginia. So there was no way that I could be in an entertainment hub, afford to <laughs> live there and do an internship after school. So I would say if you can do an internship while you're in school, great. If you can't though, if you guys have part-time jobs, find a way to either do some sort of side hustle where you get experience in the entertainment world. So maybe you are um, helping someone with their social media. You know, Maybe you are shooting some little projects on the side, even with friends or from school <laughs> projects or whatever. Just try to make that known too. Maybe you're a bartender on the side. That shows me that you can multitask. I think there's a lot of different ways that you can show that you're up for the job um, and just try to you know, interpret those roles into what you think the person's looking for. Cool. Um, I think that one, we beat that one to death. Uh, um, uh, and, you know, I, I didn't mean to answer. I think I just did the instant, somebody asked Michael Menino, instant gratification versus the long game. I think I just answered that question. You know, to me, it's always about the long game. But again, these are personal choices, though. So, um, uh, um, I'll throw this one to uh, Tristan. How was the transition from working on the Tony Danza show and now to the Wendy Williams show? Um, <laughs> well, they're very different shows. Uh, one this, I, that's one got one. canceled after two years, um, and the other's been on for uh, now 12. I had a bunch of other, you know, jobs uh, in between. Um, I, I will say the thing that they had in common is that they're both live, um, and I will say live TV. Uh, Tyra was not live, and I would literally go to work at Tyra at like 8 30 in the morning and on tape days, I would leave at midnight and then I would come back again the next day and, and 
uh, and do it. So I, I definitely knew that that was not uh, for me for the for the long uh, long term. But um, the very different shows they were they were um, on. Tony was on in two thousand four, two thousand five, and Wendy came a few years later. Um, I think it's an example though. Tony Danza. I don't know if people are how familiar they are with Tony Danza. Was he was a boss, but he was uh, obviously a big sitcom uh, personality. Um, and Wendy was a syndicated radio host um, in you know a handful of markets um, who wasn't a well known in a nationally well known uh, personality. And so I think it's just an example of what makes a successful talk show really is personality um, and somebody who has a clear uh, a point of view and opinion. Um, and I think with Tony, you know, he he was known as an actor, but he in the in the daytime space, you know, wasn't able to ultimately connect with the audience and where Wendy, again, somebody who wasn't known on the national stage. Um, and it was a slow build for sure. And I think, you know, uh, we definitely spent some time to, you know, uh, for the show to build up and, and to, and to grow, but, you know, she's, you know, example of somebody who she, you know, clear point of view, unique, unique opinion, uh, unique personality, and was able to stand out. Um, and, and Lonnie always talks about, you know, he has a list. I don't know if he still maintains it, but all these sh talk shows that come and go, um, that last one, two seasons, that's typically, you know, how a lot of how long a lot of these shows, you know, last. Any show lasting a talk show more than two years is very rare. Uh, and Wendy is part of that, you know, small club. Um, and I think it's really just a credit to, to her and her unique, uh, you know, personality, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. Um, I want to jump to this because this one's actually, I think also an important question for everyone, certainly who in college these days. I'm going to throw it to uh, Adam, Tristan, and Karen Bonk because you deal with it more than I do, and I'm too old, so I don't have to worry about it. How do you guys feel about live streaming and it becoming more of a popular idea? I, mean, I, I think really we should talk about it more as just as a streaming, as the future, you know, of TV, more so than traditional broadcast. I, look, it's coming. Um... It, that's that's where it is. Uh, you, you know, we we try and educate ourselves as much as we can on a year to year basis about the new technologies that are coming out, whether it's uh, new resolutions that the stations are using. So our shows have to, you know, get up to speed on those things and, and live streaming. I mean, we, we see, you know, and Tristan, I'll let you chime in a little more on this, but you, you know, we, we see a much better you know, return rate, if you will, like on our videos that we post online, if it feels like it's live, you know, the Wendy Williams show does significantly better in ratings when it's live. People are constantly looking for that content that is new, that is happening in the moment. And I, I, I definitely think that's where we're all gearing up to, to go towards. I, mean, I think broadcast television is changing so much and the way, the way people consume content is changing. I mean, I, a few years ago, canceled my cable subscription, and now I just, you know, have Apple TV and watch what I want when I want to watch it. Um, there still is. But a, all of you should watch all of our shows on the air when they are happening. Yeah, Don't yeah, listen to yeah, this yeah. knucklehead yeah, that exactly. I hired. But I will say that obviously there is a uh, a large daytime viewing audience, which is why um, <laughs> we we're, we're in business and keep producing content. But also, you know, you have to when you're launching a show like this, you obviously now have to, to think about the digital social component, right? Because there's there's other ways to distribute, you know, for example, we distribute Wendy, um, you know, over Roku um, and, you know, post the full episode on YouTube as well as the individual segments. And um, we're shooting uh, exclusive digital content, after show content for Wendy's Facebook and uh, YouTube channel. These are all additional revenue streams that, you know, you have to tap into. So like, and, and yeah. that you, at this point need in order for a show to be, um, you know, successful, it certainly helps. Uh, I mean, but to Adam's point, you know, if nobody's watching the Wendy Williams show on television, uh, then there's not going to be the Wendy Williams show on, 
on social. I, I think. Well, part- and unless we figure out, mon- sorry, Tristan, yeah. unless we figure out the monetization, right? It's yeah. like if there's a critical mass moving over to live streaming because that's the preferred method, people have to figure out on the back end how to to monetize it just as much as we do broadcast so that we can afford to make these shows. Yeah. I think caught in Providence is a good example of like, you know, we was a court show that we did. Um, the sh- we have 10 million followers on Facebook and it just couldn't find a, you know, an audience uh, in, in daytime. Um, so the show was on the air for two years and it was, you know, canceled in syndication, but we're continuing to produce, um, you know, online and it's, been very successful, you know, for us. So I don't know if that answers your question, but hopefully. Isn't it 70% of households have some form of streaming now? Mm-hmm. So it, it's going to only get bigger. Like it's going that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not even going that way. It's there. It's already there. It's, yeah. it's there. Yeah. We, it's we, we have shows like I helped Fremantle with this 50 year old game show or game show network. We're going to make like $10 million a year just on streaming. They're 50 year old game shows. Um, as we're doing, is there anyone, you know, I know there's still a lot of questions left here. Is there anyone who's left has a question you want to raise it? You know, just ask. Good. Deja, why don't you unmute yourself and just. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys, like, I feel like all of your, um, careers have like some, to some degree, you guys are all like creators or like, I would like to say even artists to some degree. So how do you guys like um, stay true to the image you want to put out and stay true to like your authentic message without um, kind of settling settling for what other people want you to put out? That's a really good question. Yeah. And that's something that's really hard to do and something we are constantly (laughs) researching, constantly meeting about, always re- you know meeting again to rethink and see how we went over the last six months x amount of time whatever it is that's that's uh you know tristan said the difference between wendy and tony danza was wendy had this authentic voice and we had the vision of you know and this was you know lonnie in the room when we first met uh wendy and it was the let her go like let her go make this show and sure along the way it was like oh should we try this should we try that and sometimes it just doesn't work and you don't just say it didn't work but so you know so be it let it keep going you 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 stop and you sit and you listen and and there's studies that you can do where you know i'll let lonnie talk about a little bit more but it's you you go out into the field and you ask people what they like and don't like about the show you you never stop trying you never stop trying to to get it right it's um it's one, it's about authenticity, but two, and you touch on a great thing, everything in, in life is truly about compromise, you know? So do you want to stay true to, to your vision? Sure, until it's not working, <laughs> you know? And, and then you go, all right, well, that doesn't work, you know? So why would we do that, you know? So you, you, yeah, because you want to believe in it and you end up fighting. I mean, we fight with talent who wants to do something um that's not working like you know and it's a business at the end of the day it's a business we spend a lot of money making these shows and we don't do it for charity we want to make money doing it right so at the end of the day you know as i always say you know the business world is not a democracy <laughs> it's it's a kingdom right and the those who have the money and pay for it not those who have the money but those who pay for it are king Right. And, you know, and if at the end of the day, my bosses tell me this is what you're going to do. Right. And and we do have great conversations about it and they hear us out. But if they say this is what you're going to do, it doesn't matter, you know, if I want to really try to stay true to a vision because you got to do what you got to do. It is a business, but you fight your cause and people really appreciate, you know, or should appreciate you pitching your, your vision and why you want to stay true to it. Uh, um, you know, one of the things I'm most proud about for the Wendy Williams show, and I, I, I joke with him all the time, I'm my boss on this, so I, I, I don't, you know, it's okay, I think, for me to divulge it. For the first three years of the show, he insisted that Wendy had to have somebody to talk to on, you know, besides, you know, she comes out of those who've seen the show, she talks for 20 minutes by herself every day. 
Um, she talks to Suzanne a little bit, but for, for, for the most part, you know, she's talking to herself and it's, it's never happened in TV. She has to have somebody. She has to have a regular. Everyone has a regular. And my answer always used to be just because it's never been done doesn't mean it's wrong, right? It just means it hasn't been done. And I stood firm on that. And then uh, my partner in New York who came in after the show was launched. She stood firm on that. The EP stood up. Wendy never, by the way, would have let that happen anyway, but that's besides the point. And it worked, you know? That's the core of the show is Wendy Williams talking to you for 20 minutes. Um, I don't know, maybe somebody else would have said, you're right, and just collapsed to the boss and said, yeah, let's put it go, and it wouldn't have worked. So, but, uh, um, so you, you, it's a really tough, it's a great question, by the way, but it's a tough one to answer because, you know, you, you, you as a, on the creative side, you want to be passionate. That's what people look for, but also be smart about when do you compromise, right? And do what you want to do, you know, and, and do what somebody else wants to do or find the middle ground. Let me jump in here and just say, we've come to the end of our time. And I want to thank everybody the students and the, and the executives who all have shown up. And this is wonderful that Lonnie puts this together every few years and maybe we can get him on an, even a better rotation and all that. Uh, but uh, so we got the emails and I'm not quite sure how we can keep going, but it's really, we've used up a lot of time. I mean, a lot, you know, we've, everybody's been very generous with their time. So I have to sort of say- No problem. Again. One more question maybe? Sure, anyone out there, question, anyone? Okay. Um, oh. Oh. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> okay, I'll make it really brief. Um, so you said that we have to have a lot of tough skin in order to be in the industry. What are, were, were there certain moments where you kind of had to build that for yourself or were you always just at that level? I, I, I told you at the beginning, I thought I wanted to be an agent and you work, uh, we started in a mail room where it doesn't matter who you are, you are the dumbest human living at that moment in the United States of America. That's, that's who you are because you, that's, that's the way you do it. And some people cannot stand being spoken to like that. Some people talk back and figure it out. Some people let it roll off. You know, it's not there. You're going to find a situation that you're not going to enjoy. And, um, you know, nowadays uh, there's, there's a big difference in how people are allowed to speak to you, uh, in a professional setting, which is great. Um, so hopefully, you know, you can handle someone saying, I don't like your idea. It's supposed to be blue, not yellow. And, uh, you know, hopefully it doesn't get escalated to a point beyond that. But again, there, there's, there's places within the industry where you can make a valid complaint that says that it's, you can't talk to me like that. And I work you know, for world-class, world-class yellers, screamers, throw things, crazy. Billy, Billy worked for people who were known around the world for their tempers. Yeah. Like the, the phone, he wanted a new, my, the president of Warner Bros. wanted a new phone because his phone, but they said it wasn't broken enough. So he takes the phone, throws it across the room, shatters in a million pieces. He's like, now it's broken enough. And then they framed the wall, hole in the wall. He framed it. <laughs> I mean, just crazy people. Things have gotten a lot better. <laughs> that, guy, that, that, that guy would be fired now. He, he would yell and scream. And then he'd go, want to come over for dinner? And I'd like, ah, no, not tonight. Not tonight. <laughs> Well, I worked for Martha Stewart, who literally <laughs> would say that napkin is the wrong shade of blue or, you know, this. Suzanne, that was Jim Peritore I was talking about. Oh, it was. Oh, my God. Rest wow. in peace. I love I him. him. I, love, I, I loved him. I loved him. I mean, he's uh -huh. the other singer, but I loved Jim. I miss him so much. I know. He was a great guy. Yeah, we were uh, very but, close. You know, when you when you work with these people, you develop tough skin through the years, and that's just the way it is. I mean, that's just the industry. And when you get, um, you know, people like with a like a Martha Stewart, I mean, she really, she was a tough one, but she knew her shades, she knew her colors. Like if she wanted the wall to be a certain shade, you made it that certain shade, and she was right. And you just rolled with it. And as hard as it was because you chose the wrong shade, you just, you just changed it. That was it. And, and now, no, I mean, nothing, nothing rattles me after four years of changing 
colors and napkins and walls and all that. Nothing rattles me. 15 years of Dick Robertson. <laughs> um, well, we've sent, most of us have sent emails. You have contacts. Feel free to reach out to us. Feel free to reach if you just have another question you want asked. Um, send a resume. Uh, if you're interested in, in, in internships at Wendy, you could send it to uh, Matt. I don't know if Ray, Ray, did you put your email up there? I don't even know if Ray's still here. So, uh, Ray got kicked um, off. I'm, I'm no, I'm back. I was having internet issues. Okay. Um, I just put my email on the uh, on the thread. Yeah, and they'll get it to the right people, you know, at Wendy, you know, to, to uh, and, and, by the way, internships are a little dicey. I don't know what how uh, professors are, are, are the schools handling it right now. I know last year they were taken away. They weren't permitted anymore because of the pandemic. So I, I don't know when they could come back, when, if they have come back or they can, but, you know, hopefully they will. We're a big supporter of interns at the show. So we'd like to have them and then certainly on Nick too. So we'll have two shows if they're permitted again that, you know, I know Wendy, we do about 20 interns every three or four, like three semesters, I think. Is that right, right? Every like three times a year we hire? Yes, uh, a couple less in the summertime just because we're yeah. in a shorter period, right, 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 about, right. but about that on average. Yeah, you know, um, so yeah, please reach out. It's, you know, it's the balls on your court, you know, and I, we hope to be, I hope to be returning. I haven't been in New York in 15 months. And if hopefully, you know, in the fall semester, I, we could come and do it in person, which would be my preference. If, <laughs> If we get back to that place, fingers crossed that we do. Um, so that's it. Anything last? Last chance? Hello, everyone. I just want to say one thing. Um, I hope everyone watches the Wendy Williams show on Monday. I will be on Ask Wendy. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, and another thing about the audience with Zoom, I think everybody should try to try to do it because I've been in person. And I've been through Zoom, and the good thing about Zoom, you get to see the control rooms, and you get to see the production, and the, and I think that's pretty cool. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, nice. All your knowledge. How'd you get hooked up on Ask Wendy? Um, I spoke to Patrick. He told me to say hi to everyone today. Um, <laughs> I asked a question that was on the show two weeks ago, and I asked a question, and he reached out to me today and we spoke and I already signed all the documents I had to sign, and I'm ready for Monday. All right, <laughs> that's awesome. Am I, if I'm um, pronouncing your first name right, it's Anna Rolisa? Yes, Anna Rolisa. I spoke to Patrick because uh, one day you might I not will, have, have. I will see you on the Zoom farm on Monday morning. Yes, thank you so much. You I'm much better looking in person. Oh, Nero? Nero? <laughs> you have Nero, yes. Oh, I'm looking at your question right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have it right here. Oh, that's what it is. I want to know. Hey, you guys no, should rehearse. Oh, you got to tune in. You got to tune in, you cord cutter. <laughs> oh, Nero, you're in a dilemma. Okay. <laughs> yes. Can't wait for the advice. The wise All advice. Right. Of that's awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, that's well, a great thank you. show to land Mr. on. Foster, Professor Young, thank you for putting this together. I appreciate it. I, I always love to do this for you guys. So, again, hopefully we'll do it in person next that's year. That's a big hand for Professor Young. Yeah. Well, thank you. Really fun. Okay. Great. Great. And my guys, all thank you all for doing it for me. Thank you, everyone. Oh, we got to thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody.